let's let's talk about fighting back. Let's talk about countermeasures. If you're going to be one of the the small minority that are, are uh, able to maintain a degree of sovereignty, a degree of privacy, first I'd like to know your thoughts on sort of the state of the art on that, and maybe a, a, a more overarching view on whether the privatization of data collection, that shift from sort of concerns about government to private actors, and that does it change? Does it change that? Uh, does the threat model, does it change how, you, how you're supposed to uh, look for countermeasures? Well, so the, well, the threat model changes dramatically um, because it's not just that it's private, it's not that it's a privatized sort of surveillance state, but it's a free for all surveillance state. Mm -hmm. So, so the in, you know, to influence people, um, uh, to influence people is, is, is up for sale. Uh, where the U.S. government is just one of the buyers and you don't necessarily know who the other buyers are. Um, in fact, you typically don't know who all the buyers are. Um, so you're, you're creating this marketplace of buying power, buying influence, um, where you don't know what the price is, you don't know what the issues are, uh, you don't know who's buying, you don't know what the outcomes are. So that's a horrifically new and new uh, um, uh, threat model. As to what to do about it, um, currently I have just more and more bad news. Um, so there is this, con you know, there's this perception that, well, we do this voluntarily in exchange for good software and, and features. But that's just simply not true. Because if you take the experiment, which I started doing four and a half years ago, which is, okay, I'm going to switch my lifestyle to be as private about everything as I can. And you discover that it's not voluntary at all. Um, uh, you, you are not allowed to be, um, to be private. You know, I'll, I'll give you just one example. I'm sure a lot, most people nowadays are familiar with the concept of VPNs. Um, so, you know, the Institute runs a, a VPN, uh, privacy.app. Uh, we run our own VPN. Um, and when we're on that VPN, it masks a lot of your activities and so forth. And, not, and, and nowadays when I use it, I'm, I'm often encountering a challenge on websites saying, oh, we've seen suspicious activity from your network, therefore you need to blah, blah, blah. Now, I'm running that network personally. I get, I know for a fact that nothing bad has been done on the network because for those for the general audience, what happens is if there's an IP address that's being used for something nefarious, you can go to online databases and you can file a complaint with the registrar. In the US, it's, it's the American Registrar of Internet Networks, ERIN, um, which is why if you do a who is, if you're technical, you'll get a you know, contact here for abuse. Um, the abuse on our, on our VPN gets CC to my personal inbox. So I know for a fact there's been zero reports of bad behavior ever. Mm -hmm. So they're lying. Like big, you know, Cloudflare is lying. New York Times is lying. They haven't actually found suspicious. They can't figure out exactly who you are. So they're not going to allow you to continue on this website. So the more private you are, um, you know, then they start shutting down, blaming security and abuse, even in the cases where, you know, we can prove it's not the case. Access to public information. Last year, we had all these wildfires uh, in the West, and it was important for, you know, people's property to be able to tune in to local information from local sheriff's department. They decided to do it on Facebook. So I have to log in on Facebook uh, um, to get information to protect my life and property. And, and no, it's not voluntary. It's, it's passively tolerated along the lines of how the East Germans passively tolerated communist control for a while because the individual was put in a situation of not being able to do anything about it. So there are a lot of things that can be done. You can enable um, a, lot of a lot of privacy features and so forth. But what's, what the civil sort of disobedience movement that we need doesn't exist, which is that when some website says things like, oh, you need to click on this CAPTCHA, we need to know that you're a human, people need to, you know, email, write, pick it outside of those companies saying, no, fuck you, apologies. You don't, you know, I'm not going to click on stuff to prove, you know, to click on a bus or show how many buses there are to prove I'm a 
prove I'm a human because it's not actually to prove I'm a human. It's about confirming who I am exactly. So I think you hit on the, on the heart of the matter, which is the voluntariness of it. It's the fact that you do need to use these, these programs. You need to use these, this software. You need to use these services. You can make certain alternatives and th things, but most people in the course of their daily lives are, are going to run into something that isn't really a choice. Uh, and I think that's what Fudo most wants to, wants to change. So w what does your wish list look like there? What, what are the services? What are the, what's the software? What are the alternatives that don't exist that would need to for people to actually have those choices? Yeah, I always joke that I'm, you know, the more I get into this space, the more of a, the more depressing it is for anybody to talk to me about this stuff. Um, because the problem is that the, the, um, it, it's, it's an active opponent. It's not a passive opponent. Um, and, and by that, I mean, you know, if you're, you know, if you're developing, uh, you know, in, in healthcare, we know that in health, in health, in medicine, we know the difference, right? So, so breaking your leg because you fell down the stairs, that's a passive medical threat. Mm -hmm. The AIDS virus is an active <laughs> medical threat, right? And the difference is that if you're, if you put in some measures of, okay, we should have a can, you know, we should have something you can hold on to. You should make sure that the steps are, are high friction, um, then you're going to reduce the number of stair accidents in old people's houses. The stairwells aren't going to start counteracting that uh, and changing their behavior and their slope to cancel it. Uh, whereas, you know, an AIDS virus or, or COVID, um, you know, adapts and works around and mutates and figures out other clever ways of, of, of getting to you. So that's like an active opponent. Um, in this space, we have the worst, which is an intelligent active opponent. Um, I'll give you an example. One of the projects that, that we've worked on at, at the Institute is to try to help people read news just just to decide what to read without, you know, sharing too much information. Mm -hmm. um, and the technology is there for natural language processing to apps, you know, create abstracts of articles, presenting you abstracts of different news things. It's all within copyright, fair use. The technology is shrink wrap and it's all there instead of these, you know, clickbait, um, clickbait headlines and stuff. And in the process of experimenting with running these crawlers and, and running these data gatherers, um, we find that there's a huge amount of technology being put in as countermeasures. Um, there's AIs and data collection that's fighting back. Um, I've entertained myself by going to some of these, uh, to some conferences, um, talking to exhibitors, and there's a huge industry in like, oh, we can, we can figure out what your employees are doing on their computer. We can, uh, we can figure out what, uh, you know, your visitors to your website, we can guarantee you uh, that we know who, who the humans are because we're gathering 200 data points from all these other sites. All the, you know, the investment being put against any countermeasures to protect your privacy are like orders of magnitude bigger. Mm -hmm. So the, and we can't, exp ordinarily, you know, I would advocate legislation. The problem is that the United States is, is a biparty system and we can debate who who started it, but but currently both parties are completely dependent on the big tech companies for all the three things that are important for a political party, which is access to voter turnout, access to funding, and access to media. Mm -hmm. And frighteningly, we've got a small number of tech companies who are in, who increasingly, you know, controlling all of those. In the, in the last couple of elections, when traditional big tech starts popping up on my phone, don't forget to vote, I can't believe there's not an uproar among Americans. That is none of your freaking business, whether I'm voting or not, computer, fuck off, I'm a human, this is between us humans. But everyone's just accepting it, oh, that must be a good thing, it's like, no. Um, you know, they, they'll, they, it, it's, it's controlling all the access between um, it's, it's interjecting and controlling the decision making of the civil, civilian populace. So what needs to happen is civil disobedience, civil pushback, 
uh, not accepting these things. Um, we need some of the, of the righteousness energy that seems to be prevalent in our culture for all sorts of other irrelevant political issues um, should be pointed at things like this. And in fact, I believe some of the reasons that we get a lot of um, uh, these uproars, and I'm not going to mention any of the particular political issues because then people are going to get triggered into their programmed responses for it. Um, but it's these things are amounting to excellent distractions. Um, you know, let's argue about this little thing or this little thing or this little thing instead of the fact that, you know, the free will of the U.S. population is being removed um, to for the benefits of unknown um, and with with a very with a with, with a very scary future. So there needs to be you know, push back against this. That and and the technological means to, to, to affect that push. Well, so the technological means are just going to single you out as the only person that cares about privacy, right? You've, you've heard the phrase, um, you know, everyone's heard the phrase on television, you know, when you get arrested, uh, anything you say can be used against you. Um, people haven't realized that everything you've ever said anywhere can always be used against you in some arbitrary court of law. And it can be a criminal thing, it can be some lawsuit, it can be some, something bogus, it can be something real, it can be family court, it can be, it can be whatever, um, where every, you know, this massive amount of data is available for lawyers and courts and, and, and whatnot to go digging for anything that can be used to argue something and often unlike in a Miranda warning often you don't have the right to remain silent you, correct you, you, you correct. more or less have to give this information up in order correct. to go about your life